Good evening and uh, welcome to Race Church Wednesday Night Bible Study. I hope you were all able to get your votes in before yesterday's uh, deadline. I tell you, I'm so weary of political calls on my phone and ads on that I could just scream and I'd hope there wouldn't be any runoffs, but it looked like we're going to have at least two. Or we're going to have one, maybe two, so uh, we'll have to endure to the first week of January to be done with the election. So I just ask you to pray with me that there will be peace and acceptance of the decision of the voters and uh, that we'll have a smooth transition to whatever transitions are going to have to be made in our government starting uh, next January. Uh, well, tonight we're going to conclude our study of 2 Thessalonians, and I'll be covering chapter 3, uh, uh, verses 1 through 18. Uh, first of all, let's look at verses uh, 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. You know, the, the wonderful benediction uh, at the close uh, of chapter 2 that, that I read uh, last Wednesday, uh, you know, makes it appear at least that Paul may have intended for that to be the closing of this letter. Uh, but then determined that something else needed to be said. Like he said, oh, oh, yeah, I almost forgot, like I do a lot of times. Please pray for us. And he asked them to pray that the gospel would prosper everywhere they went, just as it had in Thessalonica. And also that Paul, uh, that, that God would deliver Paul and his companions from the wicked people in the areas where they were that opposed the gospel. He then assures them uh, <clears throat> that God will strengthen them and protect them from the evil one. He expressed confidence in the Thessalonians that they would continue to obey the instructions that they'd been given through Paul and the other apostles. Now, again, this could be the closing of the letter again. There's another benediction here. But something else came to mind or was brought to his attention uh, before the letter was sent. So he had to add some more to it. And that's in verses 6 through 15. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For your, you yourselves know, uh, ought to, uh, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We do this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he, will not, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy, but they are busy bodies. Some people, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him that he may feel ashamed, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him 
as a brother. Uh, in the New International Version, it would appear uh, that the only issue being dealt with is idleness. Uh, and Paul had previously uh, dealt with this subject in his first letter, you, you might recall. Uh, now, if you read some other uh, translations, uh, we find the word disorderly conduct uh, in the first, uh, in, in verse 5, uh, to keep a brother who uh, is involved in dis disorderly conduct or who is unruly, it could be uh, conducted. So, so the NIV translation uh, presumes that idleness is the disorderly conduct. Uh, but that really doesn't make sense to me because idleness is addressed specifically in later verses. Uh, and... Uh, so I prefer the older translations, and what they presume is that the idleness has led to some disorderly or unruly behavior. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about that, I can't uh, count the times uh, I heard that old saying when I was a kid, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Well, uh, you can say the same thing about an idle body you don't have something to engage yourself, uh, it's opportunity uh, for the devil to work on us. Well, if you recall, the original idleness that Paul addressed in 1 Thessalonians stemmed from er an erroneous view of the second coming. Some thought that it, the, his second coming was going to be immediate, he'd be here any day now, and and that therefore work, worldly work, things in the world were just superfluous. They, they weren't going to matter about anything, so we should just wait and pray and, uh, and until Jesus get here. Well, <laughs> the thought came to me, now, as I said, I, I don't read the original languages, and so I can't draw too much from it. I have to rely on uh, commentaries and the like. But it, it seemed to me when I was reading this, I, I would think that after they waited and prayed for a while, they got bored. <laughs> and they said, oh, hey, well, Jesus is not coming as quickly as I thought, so let's have a party. Uh, and, you know, having a party is okay, but apparently something got out of hand, resulting in disorderly or unruly con conduct. Now, in my frame of reference, and the text doesn't say this, but in my frame of reference, it would seem that the nature or source of that disorderly conduct uh, was that they, they got into the wine. They had too much wine, and they were doing things that were inappropriate. And uh, <laughs> some things never change, do they? And, and Paul is, is correcting them for the unruly behavior, and all of that came from their idleness. And then so next, Paul continues to deal with the subject of idleness itself. And apparently some of those who were supposedly waiting on the Lord were also sponging off others in the community. They weren't working or doing anything, just sitting around expecting others to feed them. Now, Paul commands them to follow the example of the apostolic group uh, that Paul led that came and originally preached the gospel to those at Thessalonica. He said they worked and uh, while the whole time they were there and they paid their own way. And he says we did that as an example to the church even though we had the right to expect support because, you know, because of what they were doing. And, and the rule was made clear. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Now, I think that I should add that that rule presumes that one is able to work and secondly, that they can find work uh, to do. 
And we know that even in times that we're experiencing right now, people are out of work and they can't find jobs. And that this pandemic has just turned everything upside down. And certainly Paul was not having reference to people who find themselves in situations like that that are not their personal choice. So uh, the, that rule does not negate in any way our obligation and responsibility to support the poor and the homeless and disenfranchised persons uh, in our communities. Uh, neither does it negate our obligation to support missionaries. You know, but missionaries work. The problem is that the labor they're doing doesn't produce income. Most of the time they're in very poor areas of the world. And so we ought, as the church, support them, uh, supply them with enough funds that they can live uh, reasonably, comfortably in the environment where they are missionaries. Now, Paul, in his travels, noted several times that he received gifts uh, to support the ministry that they were doing uh, from the other churches that they had, had planted, even ones like uh, the Thessalonians. Uh, so, uh, so, yes, we need to provide support to those. So uh, if a man doesn't work, he can't eat. That's assumed he can work and that he can find, uh, can find work to do. They're not extenuating circumstances. Now, Paul gives a pretty hard instruction <laughs> to the church uh, that they were not to associate with anyone who does not follow and obey uh, this standard. Now, this rule uh, follows what God had instructed the Israelites from the beginning, that when they moved into the promised land, uh, they were not to associate with their neighbors uh, who worshipped other gods. They didn't want them having you know, very little to do with them. So the degree of disassociation uh, is whatever is necessary to keep the disobedience from influencing others in the church. You know, the old adage, one bad apple spoils the whole barrel and, and that kind of thing. And, 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 and of course, it's true. And I think in, in this situation, Paul uh, expressly negates any idea of like excommunication. If you're not going to do what's right, you know you're out of the church. Because he says, don't regard them as enemies, but warn them as brothers or sisters. Uh, they're still considered part of the church. They haven't been booted. But he says, let them know that you're unhappy with the way they're behaving and that what they're doing is not good for the fellowship. So maybe it would be excluding them from the corporate worship when they join together. But he doesn't mean excommunicate them. Uh, the idea, of course, is to coerce them into obedience and falling into the pattern, the norm that has been established. Well, then Paul does give what turns out to be his final benediction uh, in this letter. And let me just close by reading it, and then we're going to have a prayer together. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, there is a prayer that I've prayed through the years, been picked up by uh, AA, as a matter of fact. It's called the Prayer of Serenity, though they don't use the whole part. It was originally penned by Reinhold Niebuhr, a theologian, and I thought in the times which we are about to move into uh, with all the unsettlement and unrest that may surround this election process, 
this prayer just came to mind. So I thought we could share it together as a way to close our time together tonight. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, taking this world as it is and not as we would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. And Lord, I add, be with those among us who are...